Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Semi Soccer Experts Podcast, also known as the C, C- Podcast. Podcast. All right, Adrian, you always know what number are we on today? 43, my man. 43. 43. I can't think of anything special about 43. Four plus three is seven. Seven, the best sevens in the world. Uh, that's a that's a very easy list to go through. Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, I think who's wearing seven for Barcelona right now? Griezmann. Griezmann's wearing seven. Beckham more seven. Who else is another famous seven? There's got to be a lot of sevens. I'm just playing it out right now. Um, the one before Ronaldo, Figo. Uh, yes, at Portugal. Luis Figo wore seven. Who who Keep wears Colombia? You guys, who's your had seven at Juve before Cristiano got there. <laughs> you gotta give that shit up. Yeah, we don't. We don't really. I don't. For, for Colombians, the seven wasn't a big thing. It was always number tennis. 10. Tennis, your your big number or nine? A big number. I mean, I'm sure it, somebody a winger is gonna take a seven. I just can't think of the seven right now. Um, I don't want to think about Colombia right now. Uh, <laughs> but. You know, it's uh, we're nearing the end of the year, so some of the championships just ended. I think uh, Mexico, Liga MX, and uh, the MLS just finished uh, this past weekend. Leon was crowned champions of Mexico, and the Columbus Crew was crowned uh, was crowned <laughs> champions of, of the United States. Uh, you know, I think we got to talk about that. Adrian, which one? Which one of those two should we tackle first? Well, let's talk about the easy one for us um, from MLS, Columbus Crew. Um, as funny as it is, um, Seattle were in the final against them. And a lot of people were predicting that Seattle was going to, you know, be the, the dominant force and retain again because they were the champions from last year. And the crazy thing about Seattle is they're, not, they're never the best team going into the playoffs, but they know how to get it done. And that's the one thing we've seen from them for the past couple of years that they are not always the most dominant team, the most – um, co- consistent team within the MLS that has some four games, but when it comes to playoffs, they just, they just turn into a different beast, and they they won they won almost won like I think three titles in the last five years. So, you know, a lot of kudos to them. But Columbus Crew, you know, they took it to them, and I watched part of the game on this past weekend, and you know, they they went at them quick they, because they knew if they kept the game. The way it was, like 0-0, 1-0, they know Seattle can come back and start winning because they had the firepower. And Columbus Crew took advantage of that and were able to be dominant for the first half and take it over for the second half. So, yeah, major props to Columbus Crew. And it's it's, it's interesting, too, to see a different team other than, like, Seattle or your Galaxy or, like, even Toronto. You know, different teams make it way more competitive from MLS from a viewer standpoint standpoint yeah from a viewer standpoint you know it makes it more exciting i mean it, seattle's been to the last i think the last five years has been into the final has won i think two of those last finals yeah i think they were against toronto because toronto they lost one against toronto they beat toronto and they beat toronto twice I'm, i remember that clearly i uh, know toronto won one and then in in between there it was the atlanta versus portland uh final and that one, obviously, we all know Atlanta won that. And then the Columbus Crew. You know, what's very special about this Columbus Crew team is that, you know, a couple, what is it, two, three years ago, uh, the team was going to move to Austin. Columbus Crew was going to be Austin, yeah. Austin FC. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it just shows that I think that whole movement of save, hashtag save the crew was worth it at the end. You know, they came back with a championship. And like you said, I watched that first half of that game. Columbus was extremely dominant. I, I, I did not expect Seattle to be such a, a really poor team. It, it didn't, they didn't look, in that first half, they didn't look like they were uh, worthy of being in the final. Um, they did get a couple more opportunities in the second half, but I think, you know, Columbus just sealed the deal with the third goal and, you know, all is well in Columbus. Um, I forgot the MVP, Argentinian kid. Uh, got the MVP, and in the last fi- last time Columbus won the, the MLS Cup, there was another Argentinian. It was uh, Guillermo Skeleto, which I think he is the coach of San Jose, if I'm not mistaken. He probably is. <laughs> I'm bad with the coaches out there in MLS, to be honest. I think he is the Earthquakes coaches right now, if I'm not mistaken. Nope, never mind. <laughs> 
I don't know. Skeleto is, is somewhere in the world of MLS. But again, you know, just going back to the fact that Columbus was not going to be a team at some point, and you know, they managed to save the franchise because the Cleveland Browns bought them, and uh, you know, they won a championship. I think it's it's a great it's a great story for them. It, it it's it's just great for the city of Columbus. You know, especially Ohio doesn't really get a lot of uh, national championships. I think the last national championships Ohio had was a uh, uh, the Cavaliers with LeBron James, and that's about it. Yeah, so I'm looking up the Argentinian player you mentioned. It was um, that won the MVP, Lucas Zelarayon. Yeah, um, he played a great game. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. He contributed a heavy, I believe he gave a couple of assists. Yeah, he scored two goals and assisted. So he was pretty much the major face. Um, dominated the game for them. Um, he is, yeah, he plays as a number 10 right behind Zardes. And I also saw um, uh, he played for the Red Bulls, Derek Antony. Um, he was a winger for the Red Bulls, but never started for them. And he ended up getting traded over to Columbus Crew. And now he's he scored, a, not the game-winning goal, but an important goal in the MLS Cup final. So I know Red Bull fans is definitely not liking that. But it's what happens, it's what you got to do when you question, you know, just difficult decisions with the club, like why are you letting go of these players? But that's another topic for another day. That's another thing. Um, and we can talk about now, let's just move on really quick and uh, talk about Liga MX. Since it's going to be a segue into our next topic, uh, Leon was crowned champions of uh, Mexico when they beat uh, Pumas. Uh, I want to talk about the tie with Pumas and Cruz Azul prior to this. This is a very interesting thing that I, I didn't know. Um, obviously, it's done before, but uh, in the – and um, uh, how do you say it now? I forgot. In the, the aggregate score. The aggregate score was 4-4. Four, four. Uh, Pumas tied it up to 4-4 four, four in the last minute. And Pumas went ahead even though they tied on the way goals. The way goals were still 4-4, four, four, but because Puma had – finished higher in the regular season table above Cruz Azul, they were given the priority to go first, which I thought it, it, it's kind of upsetting. You know, when you get into this uh, La, La Liguilla or the knockout stages, you kind of want to wash away the past table and the past segment of the, of, the, of the competition. And, you know, you're in the knockout stages. We don't have to worry about the rest. But in the way that Mexico does it, yeah, you still got to take in count the, the table which I, I thought was kind of a little bit ridiculous. I wasn't a fan of that notion. You know, seeing that Pumas had just only tied 4-4 on a scoring merit, I think they should have gone to penalties or gone into the extra time. But it is what it is. Uh, and then Pumas eventually played Leon in the final, and Leon won. Uh, fun fact about Leon, Landon Donovan, I think that was Landon Donovan's, Landon Donovan's last professional club as a footballer. Uh, I think he did play a little bit of indoor major league indoor soccer. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> knowing Donovan. But, yeah, it's been an interesting um, season for, for these teams as well. Um, and one thing I want to touch base on are, like, a little bit of the rumors that we've been hearing is that um, there's a potential merger between both MLS and Liga MX. So, Mario, I believe you have more insight about this. Care to share? So, yeah, Grant Wall had an uh, interview with Don Garber, and there was uh, what it looked like alluding to that at some point they were in talks of merging uh, Liga MX into MLS. Now, as fans, I can tell you right now, I'm not, I'm not a fan of this at all, you know. Um, it's, been, it's, not, it's not no secret that the American soccer business world is encroaching on – the Mexican soccer world, and they're starting to collaborate more and more to the point that, you know, the people that run MLS and the U.S. Soccer Federation are going to be the same people that run Liga MX and, and the Mexican, Mexican Soccer Federation. Uh, you know, that's not 100% true, but it, it seems to be going into that direction. You know, money-wise, sure, you're probably going to be making more money because you can demand more from the TV revenues or demand more from the sponsors. But from a sporting perspective, you're, you're not going to have, you know, MLS is approaching 30, uh, 30 teams. Liga MX has 20 in the first division and they got to incorporate the, the second division, which, which is all within the same system. 
You know, mind you, MLS is a single entity, and now all these teams in Liga MX are individual franchise, individual teams, but in the, within the same system between the first, second, and third tiers. That's what I was going to say. He's going to mess up a lot of the cash flow for both teams. Uh, absolutely, you know. And now, well, you could talk about the United States with the USL. Well, you know, MLS operates independently of the USL. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so there's that issue. On a sporting merit, you know, USL, where does USL stand for? Where does the NISA stand on? Where does, um, you know, these other smaller leagues, smaller teams in, in, in this country stand? Um, I'm not a fan of this. I, I don't think this is a good idea because, again, just going back, MLS is a single entity. You know, all these teams are franchises. They're not individual companies. Liga MX, on the other hand, Club America is different from Chivas of Guadalajara. You know, and if you think about the rivalry and the competition between those two teams, I don't think they want to collaborate on any any front. Yeah. You know, unlike unlike you know New York City, New, NYCFC, and the New York Rebels, and all honestly are the same company. You know, they they owned by MLS, they're a single entity, whatever. As you could say, you can make the arguments that NYCFC is owned by the City Group and Rebels is owned by Rebels, whatever. But they still have to. You know, they have the, to deal with MLS as a, as a whole thing because all the rules and restrictions, um, even including designated players, I'm pretty sure Liga and Mexicans don't do. They don't um, do that. Right. They just buy whoever the fuck they want to. They be they want. Absolutely. You know, there is no salary cap in Mexico. Yeah. There so that's no- going to be a very different, like, uh, selling point for t- MLS teams against Liga and Mexicans teams because if that's the case, what's, n- what's not to give for Liga and Mexicans to attract any players? And they got to figure that out as a whole financial standpoint because if they want, you know, them both to collaborate, because you're going to have MLS teams complaining that, hey, these teams from Liga and Mackey's can buy whoever they want. This, that's a disadvantage for us. You know, right. because we have a salary cap. They don't. Right. So right. you could definitely see both sides, you know, bitching and going at each other because it's not going to it's not gonna make any sense. And there's so much – um, issues stemming from that, even if you were to combine it, you need to have a structured salary cap. And the other thing too is like, I'm not saying a lot of these MLS teams don't have money, but some of them really don't have the money wherewithal to compete against like any other top teams with Liga MX if they were to set like a higher salary because that's what they're going to have to do. There has to be a higher salary cap because Liga MX are not going to settle for the bullshit money that MLS pay their own, you know, the, um, athletes. So something has to be made and the only way it's going to be made is going to be going up. You know, and, and you know what the, the thing is, though, that, you know, MLS is the structures based off the NFL. Remember, Don Garbo is an NFL guy. Yep. You know, I don't, I don't see him get rid of the salary cap, the designated player, the designated player, all this, um, you know, what is it, the international slots, all that stuff. You know, it's very interesting because, you know, they, they, they set these rules up for competitive ballots. Yep. This is why we saw such a great Philadelphia side. You know, Philly, I think this is the first time that Philly won the Supporter Shield. I could be mistaken. But in my recent memory, this is the best Philly team I've ever seen. Usually, Philly's at the bottom. Yep. I've always remembered Philly being a bad team. And let's be honest, that franchise doesn't generate a lot of revenue. That team, they don't have a lot of, you know. Support. It's not, not the support, the but it's just. Then it's not you know you would think the Philly market would be a strong market to base off, but they haven't really lived up to its potential because exactly. yep. um like not just like the rebels, but it's just not like hey you think of a soccer team you're not gonna think about Philly like you're just gonna know yeah. about New York L A etc. You don't you know exactly you don't think about Philly. So again you know it's because of this competitive balance in the MLS that we got to see a great competitive Philly that won the supporter shield. Now, that's not the case in Mexico. You know, the, the team with the most money, you know, gets the most players. And now, obviously, Leon doesn't have more money than Chivas, Club America, Monterrey, Tigres, or Cruz Azul. But, you know, once in a while, there's a Leicester City in Mexico. Yeah. And, I, you know, let's just not talk about money for a second. Somehow they figure out money. If they were to merge, let's just say, the next year or two, how, how far do you think and somehow make, like, I don't know, like a 20, 30 team, like, standings? Within MLS and the Um how do how many do you think any MLS teams will make like top three, top five against like a strong Liga Mekis team? A strong, if they, you know, I, I don't see, I don't see. Um, the balance isn't there. 
the, no, the competitive balance is in there. I mean, if you did a knockout stage, yeah, you got you'll get a couple of surprises. But if you did a a whole season, you know, year long season, it's not gonna work. Now that's Travel another to Mexico, <laughs> especially you coming from New York. Fucking hell, that's gonna be a, that's actually yeah, that's how that there's the logistics of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, a team, New York Rebels has to fly over all the way over to Tijuana. Yeah. To play. So they, Rebels got to play LAFC, um, San Jose, uh, the yeah, Galaxy. It has to be like a road trip Tijuana. because it makes no sense for them to go for one game. Right. Oh, wait, to Mexico. Now, now do it, now do it in reverse. Tijuana doesn't go, want to go all the way to, 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 uh, to New, New York. York. Mm-hmm. Then you got to think about visas. Mm-hmm. Work permits. You know, not everyone in Mexico is going to have a visa to get into the United States. Not everyone who plays in the United States is going to be able to go into Mexico. You know, there's a lot of foreigners, a lot of Argentines, Colombians, uh, players from Africa, from Asia. They're not just going to get – just not, you can't just go into Mexico, you know. Yeah, all of this has to be planned ahead, and they have to – Absolutely. I mean, Doc Garber, Doc Garber didn't say that it was going to happen, you know, tomorrow, but it's a long way down the line. But still, the, even – the mention of it, I think, is stupid. Yeah. You know, I think uh, there was another thing you got to think about. Mexico, Liga MX is workers in La Clausura and La Pretura, right? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, MLS works from uh, March to November to December. So now that's another thing. You Their know, schedules are thrown off. Schedules thrown off. You know, you, you're going to get the start of uh, Liga MX in January. Who's going to play in, in New York in January? Who's going to play in Montreal in January? Yeah, you're gonna freeze their balls off. There's no, yeah, that's the thing too. Because even if they were to start the MLS that early in the season, especially in Montreal, it's gonna be super cold, and they're just gonna, especially if you're in Montreal, you're not gonna want to play there because like you gotta have to train there, practice, live, and everything. You have to deal with that. The whole playing conditions for from January until like even March, it's still cold. But right, it's, it sounds like a nightmare to say the least. If you if you think if you t- could tell me the three smallest markets in the MLS, which ones do you think they'll be? Smallest markets. Worst markets, like the markets that don't give much to MLS in general. Philly, I- I'd say Philly is one. I'll say not Philly. Um, am I going on on the whim if I say like Sporting KC? I would say Sporting KC. I say Philly. Sporting KC and maybe um, Montreal, mm, Colorado. I, Colorado, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Colorado, like somewhere with Dallas, Dallas and Houston Minnesota. are one of the worst attended teams. Yeah, that, and that's crazy because you think that's like soccer central out there in Texas, but in Texas, right? No one's fucking watching. I was gonna say those, but I'm like at the same time, Texas is a big market. I don't get why it's not selling out. I mean, New York is a big market. We know that New York Red Bull games and NYCFC games don't get attended as they should be. Oh, yeah, 100%. But at the same time, they're not there at the bottom. You know, they they got a good, at least good core of audience. Yeah. Fans who will come and see the team. So I, for, I forget about Cincinnati, even though they had the Shit. highest attendance in the USL. I don't think Cincinnati, Cincinnati has been the last two seasons that they've been in this league they're at the bottom. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I asked this because Don Garber did allude to something that about, you know, some franchises might survive this merger and some franchise, franchises might not. And that's what I got to do, like, relegation, because there's no way. I, like, I mean, so he didn't say relegation. He just said that these franchises won't be, wouldn't be included or alluded to not well, being included. Where they play, though? It, exactly. So think about this. I'm an owner that just paid – the, I'm the Cleveland Brown owner to just pay to save the Columbus crew. Now, mind you, again, Columbus just won the championship. But besides that, they're not the most profitable market. Yeah. You know, if I had to think the, the most profitable more markets, Columbus is not one of them. So what if Don Garber says, okay, we're going to get rid of Columbus. I'm the Cleveland Browns owner. I'm going to be upset that I just paid all this money to save this team. They won a, a, a championship, and now you want to get rid of them? Or yeah. what about whoever owns Philly? Philly paid money to be in this league, and now they, you know, Philly's gonna go because they want to merge with the guy Mm-hmm. So that, so that you're gonna have to trim the fat because that's the only way they would have to make it work. Right, you have to trim the fat. That exactly, you're 100 percent right. But why, why would it be Philly? Why would it be Chicago? We everyone paid to play in this system. 
Mm-hmm. Everyone paid their, their franchise fees to stay. There's no reason why they shouldn't stay, you know. And so that 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 becomes another problem. And the other thing too, I think if they do do that, I think we're not going to see Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver in the MLS anymore because I think Canada's just going to be like, hey, back off. And the other thing too is like the once they realize the, tr- the travel logistics and everything. It's not going to work for them. And the, other, the good thing is the Canadian League is starting up there. So that's a good, you know, initiative to get them on, on board. And I think if they were to make it work, you know, the, fir- the first things you have to do is to cut Canada off. I think they have to cut off those Canadian teams. As good as Toronto FC is and all, um, they can't keep – they can't stay with, with this division league or anything because – it's just going to be a nightmare for those teams, and you're just going to make everyone suffer by going to fucking Canada in January. All right, but let me ask you this. Why Canada? You know, you have Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto. They're not bad. They're, I, I think apart from Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto are good franchises. They are. You know, they, they have a lot of supporters. You know, they, you know, they send, like, that whole, especially Vancouver, Portland, and Seattle, those, that's the soccer hotbed in the United States. If, if we're being honest, that's the a, a big, huge reason for soccer. You know, uh, Vancouver just sent Alfonso Davis to the Bayern and he won a Champions League. Yeah. You know, so, so I ask you this, why Canada? You know, they, and, not everyone's going to want to be going to Canada. I can, or I can already see that coming. Um, literally envisioning it off my eyes because it's just, it's the travel logistics, the money and everything. I think it's just going to be impossible. No, no. And, and you're 100% right. But then why go to Mexico? You know, well, if you're talking- I think they, because the long term of things, if they want to make it work, you have to at least do, you can't do three countries. You got to do two countries at most. Because that's just a, that's a killer. No, I know. I know. No, you're right. But, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, a sporting system that's based on, you know, you got hockey that has works in Canada and the United States. You got basketball that has the Raptors. Uh, you have baseball that has the Toronto Blue Jays. Apart from, I don't think the NFL ever had a franchise in, in, uh, in, um, in Canada. Canada. No, it's the Canadian Football League or something. But I, I, I'd, be, I'd, say, I'd say, again, the same thing to you. I'm the owner of Vancouver. I'm the owner of Montreal. I'm the owner of Toronto. Why is my team going to get caught off if I paid money into, into this to play this game? You know, so these are these are the they questions. Have to be bought that, out. Well, not bought out, but like paid. You know, paid just, out, but you know, yeah. again, that comes with legal ramifications. But if we go back, I would rather trim the fat off of Philly. I would rather trim the fat off Cincinnati, and Cincinnati is new. Yeah, Cincinnati just got here. You know, I don't know about Nashville because they didn't get they didn't get a chance to play with full stadium with staff. Oh, so not even Nashville. You also got to factor in all these other teams that are coming into MLS as well. Outside of like just these low market, you got, the St. Louis, you got Sacramento, St. Louis, Sacramento, um, North Carolina, and uh, Charlotte. Yeah, so Charlotte. So you got all those things coming in. We're we're coming on to we're at twenty six right now. Austin twenty seven, St. Louis twenty eight, Charlotte twenty nine. Am I missing one? St. Louis, yeah. Charlotte, and Sacramento thirty. That's 30 teams. With the, with the franchises, it's 30 teams. And I think uh, NFL has 32. Hockey has 32. But that's what I'm saying. I think if they're going to do a merger, they have to tri- – you're going to at least have to do like I know you 30, 36 the, teams, I think, at the most. Or you, you have to trim the fat. But that's why I'm saying it's stupid. Yeah. Because not all Liga MX teams want to leave. They don't want to do – you can't you can't say there's some some Cause they're the same as all the other leagues. There's twenty teams and there are eighteen in the Liga MX, right? Uh, there are eighteen in Liga MX. You know, you got Querétaro. Querétaro finished in seventeenth place, but Querétaro got got money. Mm-hmm. You know, are they gonna make they're gonna make a argument for that? I don't know. You got Atlas that's a traditionally always been in the top flight of Mexico. Um, you got Tijuana, major market. Mm-hmm. Now you got a team like Leon. I, I'm not sure where Leon plays, but they're not usually the top dogs in, in, in Mexico. They want. So now where's the argument which team in Mexico you cut the fat? Is? You take all the Mexican teams. 
or do you don't? You, you choose the fat here. It's tricky. It's very it's tricky. tricky. That's why I don't. You I, gotta like. You gotta figure out what is like the the worst least case scenario in that aspect because you just have to figure out all the teams you want to factor in and the teams you want to bring in. And I feel like if they do propose this or if it's going to be sanctioned by the MX, he's, I can see a good amount of like maybe even half the teams within that league be like, well, no, we oppose to this. We don't want to be a part of you. You know, it, and it's probably just like the four or five top teams in, in Mexico, America, Pumas, Cruz Azul, Monterrey, Tigres, and Chivas. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and, and I just want to go back to s something that we've always talked about is like, you know, money, money's in, encroaching on the game where these, these club executives, they, these club owners, they just want the money, but they don't think about the sporting wise, you know, let's just say a whole half the teams of MLS are gone and half the teams of MLS are gone. You know, I can see a good case where the USL absorbs those MLS teams and then becomes a very strong and, and a better league than what this MLS Liga MX, MX hybrid is. I'm not really yeah, sure. That's the, that's the other cool thing, too, like the outcomes. Like you're definitely going to see different teams. And also you're going to see more USL, more of the local teams taking part because they're going to have to have their own local leagues. And that would be a good push, you know, for the lower, for the ones there. But at the same time, it's, it's so, it's a lot of work, <laughs> to say the least to get done. I'm just thinking about it from like a logistical point of view because you have to factor in all these regions, all these, you know, where all these teams play at, how to get there to and from, the scheduling, you know, like you said as well, the permits, everything, everything associated with that. It's mind-boggling, but, you know, I, it is possible, but it's just a pain in the ass to get it done. And and not not to repeat myself, but you're right. It, it is it is going to be a pain. It's going to be a problem. Um, but you know, you, you, they're trying to do the Super League. Yeah, the Super League in North America. Super League. And and I've seen and this this year alone in 2020, I've seen the case against the Super League. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna talk about this once. I don't ever want to talk about it again. The group of death in the Champions League. You know, uh, we saw Real Madrid, Malcolm Black, Shakhtar, and Inter. The way that group progressed to the last match day, all four teams had the possibility of going through. Yeah. Going and it through. wasn't determined until you guys lost at the end. Because you right. the way. Well, we tied. That game was tied oh, yeah, yeah. with Shakhtar 0-0. Zero, zero. Yeah, no, and you're right. It wasn't determined to the end. But, you know, on paper, the two teams that were supposed to advance from that group was Real Madrid and Inter Milan. Real Madrid had the possibility of going to the Europa League or not qualifying at all had they lost. You know, that, 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 the way these, this event went by, happened, should never have happened and never have occurred. Real Madrid should have never lost, lost to Shakhtar twice because on paper, it is the like type you're betting, man. You would bet heavy on Madrid just to get the win. Absolutely, but and then that shouldn't have happened though. Inter Milan should not have been bottom place, you know. Even it, it, you know the way I'm so <laughs> I'm upset that it happened, but it happened. That shouldn't have happened. Shakhtar should have never been Real Madrid with a B squad. Yeah, you know that, and that alone sh shows a case that. Even the teams with the most money, because Real Madrid has more money than the other two, obviously more in Madrid, but the other two, you know, even the teams with the most money, it's not going to create a better league, football-wise, quality-wise. Um, I'm sure you saw the last game with Juventus and Barcelona with, with uh, Cristiano and Messi. Barcelona looked terrible, terrible in that game. They just relied on Messi showing a shot and hopefully getting one past Buffon, but it never happened. Right, never happened. And not not to not to rub salt and wounds, but you know, Manchester United should have gone through in that group. A hundred percent. Yes, they could have. They needed a draw, man. They needed a fucking draw. Yeah, you know, but it, it just goes back to the thing, like even the team with the most money doesn't create the best soccer, the best football. Yeah. yeah. And, and 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 I think again with the case of the Columbus crew winning the MLS Cup, with the case of Leon winning La Liga Mags, not the team with the most money or the most prestige, or the most fans is going to create the best soccer. 
Mm-hmm. Columbus looked great. I, I enjoyed the game Columbus. I and, mean, you know, we, we don't enjoy American soccer. We, we like the European stuff. We like the South American stuff. You know, but I enjoyed watching, um, you know, I enjoyed watching Columbus. You know, the same thing in South America. Once in a while, you get a, you get a winner from Colombia. You get a winner from Ecuador in La Copa Libertadores and La Sudamericana. You know, yeah, they, they just were, to tie it all together, though, I think I get what you mean. And that's the interesting thing with the Super League because let's just say for shits and giggles, this has happened. And we eventually, you know, we see, like, let's just say it's split half and half, half the MLS, half the yeah, Mickey's. This will take place in, like, two, three years from now. I strongly think that Liga MX is going to dominate. And they're going to make the MLS teams look like a joke. And that's, a, that's another thing, too. It's a gamble if MLS wants to do a merger. Because, hey, they can show up and be like, hey, we're going to play against these teams from Mexico. Let's show them what they got. Imagine their African vision already. They're going to get spanked. A lot of them are going to get spanked. Because the soccer's not there compared to, like, you know, how, the, how it is in Mexico. The training's different. The way they develop the players is a lot more better. You could and you can make an argument saying, "Hey, in America, you know, we're starting to get our forefront players." But like we mentioned a couple episodes before, these are not American-born talents. These are talents who have had like family that are, that is that are born American or have American rights. So the competitive balance is not going to be there. But you know, and just even to the to the well, McKenney was born in Dallas, but even then. They actually spoke about his situation, like his his family had connects in Germany. You know, yeah, McKenney was born in, in Dallas, and he's actually pretty American. But the, because of the connects, they went to get the training, the education, the development. Not in America, in Europe. You know, same thing. Like going back to your point, the Mexican, the Mexican development, the culture, the idea of of a kid growing up with his foot on his feet is not it's not in the United States yet. Amer- we don't have a culture in America. We do not have football culture. If if anything, what we do have, it's just like a lot of us, like you and me can relate. We, we, you know, we're the sons of immigrants who embrace that culture and just brought it here. And we carry that culture. But technically, this is not American culture. This is culture from a different, you know, a different region. Like you. You're South American. I'm Central American. We got we grew up with different soccer, but we know the whole culture behind it and the love for the sport. And that's the one thing Americans don't really grasp in this day and age. And actually, I, I hate to sidetrack, but I you can also relate. Um, I know you don't stand barstool, but I I just watched this video where troops. I don't know if you've seen from AFTV. He he's brought over to bar to work for barstool to talk about Arsenal and their pains and they had a live stream of him watching Arsenal <laughs> and when they gave up a goal you could see truth very you know vivid and and just ex- going off on a rant like talking about the whole the whole um as to why Arsenal gave up the goal and you know everyone around him like our Barstool guys the Americans they don't know what the fuck he's talking they're just looking at him like Mac and Pizza. uh-huh the, the game against Burnley yeah um the one that just happened in Southampton Okay, okay, Southampton. Okay. Yeah, even Portney was there, homeboy, the Presidente. That douchebag was there, and he just talked, oh, he's just, like, as if they're watching football, like American football, not mm-hmm. like soccer. It's like, that's what I'm trying, my whole point is, like, a lot of these Americans, they don't have the, the fucking culture. They don't have the grass. And it's sad because, you know, we, there's a lot of people who live out here. And, you know, the beautiful game it can be the biggest game here in the States, but it's not, sadly. No, you're right. It's 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 a culture. It's also a cultural thing, you know. Until until MLS is on the same level with Liga MX is on the culture wise, it's going to be a very a very big gap, you know. Uh, you know, in the last twenty years, yes, MLS has been closing the gap, but they still got a long way to go. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely going to be the winners of that tournament. The whatever happens is going to be the ML- Liga MX. I, I see. Hundred yeah. percent, Monterrey, Tigres, Chivas, and America rotating that title over and over and over and over again. Like you, you may get a LAFC fucking Sounders somehow getting getting in there and try they're, get they're, they're, second they, place. Maybe win the title. Them, I don't. I don't see. I couldn't. I couldn't see LAFC or. The only reason I'm saying LAFC is because they're the only team that that actually knows how to play soccer in MLS. I, I may be wrong. But the way I see them play, they they got um, their, their structure and everything. 
they look like a team that knows how to play play football. I mean, I mean sure, you know, they they're playing soccer against other other MLS teams, but then when you put them up against the uh, Liga MX team, you know, they did good I, last night, bro. They played so so. I I want to make a good point. You know, they played Cruz Azul, right? Cruz Azul came off a grueling season, and they lost to the bitter end. Now, mind you, it's very well known that Mexican teams do not prioritize the CONCACAF Champions League. Oh, hell yeah. You know, so that I, I'm just putting out there that Cruz Azul was just ending the season. Their, their money was on La, uh, La Liga MX. They lost it. Whatever happens to the, uh, the CONCACAF is whatever happens, you know. Um, no, right. L- LAFC beat Cruz Azul. I mean, it's not the first time that an MLS side beats a Mexican Mexican side. Long term, though, I, I, I don't see it. You know, out of every five Mexican wins for the championship, you might get one American. But that, that's my opinion. Uh, I'll, I'll stick to it, though. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you on that. That's what I'm saying. Like, MLS is starting to close the gap, but they're nowhere near there. But the one thing I would say, culture wise, and I'm just bring, trying to bring it all uh, together with that. If the USA team makes an impact these next two World Cups, 2022 and 2026, because this is like going to be our next golden generation, this has the potential to bring it to the forefront and just be like, hey, you know, this is who the fuck we are. You know, we're Amer- we're the new American generation. Um, we can they can they can play their own football. It's just they don't have the r- the right coach to do it, but. <laughs> At the same time, it, it is, you know, very optimistic. And I, I can see the way, you know, the amount of talent they have is crazy. It's just getting all the pieces together and having them, you know, gel and have that chemistry to work and function, win and, you know, even lose as a team. So well, it's just, it's a long structure. But, you know, you just never, it never hurts, never hurts to think or wishful thing. It never hurts to think, you know, uh, just to add on to that, you know, I think you said earlier, like, a lot of these players are just, you know, naturalized American, not really American. And I'm, I'm thinking about all the players that are being highlighted. There was a highlight tape of all the Americans that scored recently over the past weekend. Yeah. Every single one of those players I thought about, it had some type of connection to get to Europe, to be developed in Europe. You know, uh, Gio Reyna, his father, played for Man City, works for NYCFC. They sent him over to Europe. Timothy Weah is the son of George Weah, the, the only African with a Ballon d'Or. President of Liberia went to Europe. Um, Kristen Pulisic had connection in Europe. Um, the, the, the kid that plays in uh, Barcelona B and Des. Conrad. Conrad? Yeah. They, they, they were born in – Conrad was born in Florida but grew up in Europe. And Des grew, was born in the Netherlands and grew up in the Netherlands. Yeah. You know? So – Again, like, okay, if the USA wins, let's just say wins the World Cup, I, I could not credit it to the MLS. I would not credit it at all. No. I would not credit it to any sporting achievement. But MLS is going to credit the oh, shit yeah. out of that, though. 100% <laughs> MLS. It, it, like, funny. These are our boys. <laughs> it's very interesting because a lot of the times when these players score, the MLS social media, uh, they blow MLS, up. the America, US – Federation, they, they twisted the narrative as is like this is our product. It's like no, false this is claiming. They're false claiming. <laughs> Absolutely, I think they're, they're they're false claiming. You know, I think th- there is one player, Tyler Adams, is the only player I think truly was developed by the MLS system, and even then Red the Bulls. Rebels are <laughs> European. Yeah, I think that's the only thing <laughs> Rebels. Yeah, that's the other thing. The Rebels. That's the other thing. Like in theory, it's a European company. But and that's a and that's a crazy thing because you know they are a European company and it's funny because same thing not just um, Tyler Adams but the American coach who was, who developed them too Jesse Marsh he's already in and the European Red Bull he, for not Leipzig the other team Salzburg Salzburg he's in Salzburg yeah he's the coach for them so he's another coach he's the one I, I would recommend to coach this national team but. That's another argument. I, I think, no, and I, I agree with you 100%, but I think he needs to, I, I would like to see him succeed first in, um, mm-hmm. in, in I'd like to see him succeed first as a club coach because he's the, he's the head coach of Salzburg right now. Yeah. Um, it, interesting enough, though, they were talking about the Leverkusen coach. He was born in Jersey. 
<laughs> but and, and again, the American media was spinning him as he's an American, American coach. coach. Like he is not. He he played one year of college and then he went to play lower division in, in Germany. I think he might have gotten a, a Bundesliga caps on one team, but he did his entire coaching education is German. Germany, yeah. It's Germany. It's not America. The other thing, too, the other thing too, is education is probably free in Germany. And that's the other shit, too, because your education in there in Germany is probably free. And you have an advantage out there because you're not just going to get, like, an education. You're going to get a whole football education out there, too, if you choose your, you know, you, you, you select the right fields to study in. And that's, that's a good privilege to, you know, be brought up upon because Germany, they know their shit about the footy ball. So... It's it's obviously the right decision, the smart decision to do if you're trying to develop and gain your knowledge out there. Yeah, no. So I'm just looking through this guy. Uh, uh, his name is Pellegrino uh, Matarazzo. So he, he's Italian, but he was born in New Jersey, you know, and he, he played he played at Columbia oh, yeah, New Jersey, New York City. But, you know, if you just look at his background, he, he went after he played a year in Colombia for his, his D1, you know, he went to play in the lower leagues in Germany. You know, he's got he got his German education. And, and to your point, you know, the coaching education is more accessible. It is definitely free. I mean, I, I don't know if it is free, but it's definitely more accessible than it is here. Yeah. Like me as a coach, I can tell you it's absolutely difficult to just get one, one little certificate. You know, and I'm paying $100 per certificate. I don't think that happens in Germany. Those who want to be a coach can become a coach. You know, they make that accessible. Yeah. So again, it's it's another thing where the American Americans were spinning the the success of Americans in Europe as something made made and produced in this country when it is not. Yeah. You know, but I, I totally get you. Before we go on a tangent, that's a whole other tangent. We'll always go on tangents, mate. <laughs> but I think just to, you know, bring this up like tie it all together just tie it all together um uh, <clears throat> like we're saying merger uh ridiculous idea even if it was to be brought up five years later it's gonna come with a lot of controversy a lot of people are gonna hate it it's gonna be madness and like you said um you think more more than less more than likely the mexican teams are gonna dominate that league and it's gonna it's gonna blow up in the americans face at first i think because I don't. I think you know playing against this high level caliber of Mexican teams, they're they're not just get the culture shock. They're just gonna get overwhelmed. But I do see like one or two teams like making it out because I do believe MLS do have some solid teams. But I don't know if they're that level to compete. That's the one thing that that I do question MLS in because as much um, optimism I have, I just don't think they're there yet, and mm-hmm. that's the thing. They need to work on to get there. And granted, you know, it's only a league that's been around for like what twenty years, twenty almost thirty years. So, ninety six. Hmm. Nin- nineteen ninety six was the inaugural year. So MLS has been 24 around years old. twenty four years old. Yeah, I mean twenty five. So it's yeah, it's not too bad. But at the same time, you know, we Americans, we want it now or now or never. You yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So and that's the mindset we we have. So. It's going to be an interesting next couple of years, but, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't see the, the merger happening, especially not in this day and age. I hope not, man. I hope Yeah. Not. Maybe in 10 years you can revisit something like it because I think it's – like first and foremost, the travel is going to be easier because I'm pretty sure we're going to have faster planes, trains, everything. Hopefully, hopefully. in 10 years. Hopefully. <laughs> but with that being said, I just don't see it happening because, like I said, I'm always going to be shit on. Uh, but you know, we'll see little, how it goes. A little For side. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. a little side note: uh, Columbus, when they were lifting the trophy, Don Garver, you know, was given the microphone to give a a talk or a speech, and uh, the whole crowd booed him. Which I <laughs> thought was perfect. Thought it was great. I thought it was like a big uh, slap in the face. It's like you try to take away our team, but well, we saved it and we won a championship. Yeah, yeah, because he was pretty much instrumental in breaking up the team and moving to um. Austin. Yeah. It was he was open to moving it to Austin, you know, which is crazy. No, it definitely is. Um <clears throat> with that being said, man. Um it's I don't know. I think for now, I think the best thing is that we're getting is this Conky have champions, even though it's fairly this disproportionated. Um, because LAFC is the only MLS team going through. 
and NYCFC got spanked 5-0 on aggregate. So, yeah. you know, it's pretty embarrassing to even think about of a merger. And it, it is embarrassing because if you think about it, NYCFC is probably the richest franchise and all of MLS and all of North America. On a side note, their captain just left them today, I just heard. so He got pulled, he got pulled to Austin FC. Um, but, yeah, no, uh, NYCFC has probably more money than America and Chivas and all of Liga MX combined because they're owned by Citigroup. Yeah. You know, and who has more money than Citigroup? I don't know. But, you know, it's just, it's just to show you that these super teams and super clubs don't really do much. You know, and, again, it goes back to the culture. Mexico has a better footballing culture and – no amount of money in the world you throw out MLS is going to be the, the, the raw culture and talent that a, a country could produce. Yeah, 100%. And that's one thing I do agree on. Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much it for me, Mario. You got anything else to discuss before we wrap things up? No. Uh, the little, only little thing is that uh, the PSG store was told to be ready for when Messi arrives to produce those shirts. So hmm. get, your, get your PSG jersey set. Uh, that that was a rumor I heard, I read somewhere. So we'll see, we'll see where that takes us. But no, that's it for me. Uh, well, since you mentioned that though, just one thing: you think financial fair play is going to do? You think they'll allow a team of Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe? You know, financial fair play. All, all it's a very. I mean, obviously financial fair play, but you know. If you look at Cristiano Ronaldo's contract at Juve, it's the highest, but I'm sure he's getting more kickback from endorsements and sponsorship deals. I think he gets an endorsement from Ferrari, yeah. and Ferrari owns Juventus. So, you know, Juventus directly doesn't pay him, but the whole parent company just endorses him, and he gets the, the money. You know, and I'm sure... Oh, and the other thing, too, Messi can leave on a free. He's going to leave on a free. That's fucking crazy. He's, he's living on a free, you know. Um, I, I, it's sad to say uh, I don't want him to leave Barcelona because I grew up watching him on Barcelona, but it is what it is. Oh, him um, and Car, they're going to be buddy, buddy. <laughs> Neymar, I think, but I think it would yeah, be. Kick out Icardi. He's going to be like, yo, get him the fuck out the team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want this guy here, and I, I, I wouldn't mind it, honestly. <laughs> But yes, Adrian, that's it for me. Uh, guys, if we don't produce an episode, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We'll see you all soon. Yes. want to thank you guys. Um, yeah, we're going to see if we can try to get one more episode, hopefully, before the end of New Year's. Um, I don't know, maybe like just talk about what's, what's in store for 2021. But we'll definitely touch base on that. But we want to thank you guys for listening. And thank you. And listen to our you podcast guys. on YouTube, Sp- not Spotify, fuck Spotify, <laughs> Apple, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, all that fun stuff. You can find the links. Thank you, guys, and have a good one.